sometimes it seems we are more divided than ever before. Unable to speak across the differences, we must engage to create the world we want for ourselves and our children. On Being's Better Conversations Guide is a free resource and reflection for beginning this adventure, creating new spaces for listening, conversation, and relationship. Because the point of speaking together differently is to learn to live together differently. Go to civilconversationsproject.org and find the Better Conversations Guide in the Resources tab. Again, that's civilconversationsproject.org. On Being is brought to you by the John Templeton Foundation. The Templeton Foundation supports academic research and civil dialogue on the deepest, most perplexing questions facing humankind. Who are we? Why are we here? And where are we going? To learn more, please visit templeton.org. The Templeton Foundation. Stay curious. Father Greg Boyle makes amazingly winsome connections between things like service and delight and compassion and awe. Amazing because he works in an urban setting others describe in terms of crime and despair. He landed as an idealistic young Jesuit in a gang-heavy neighborhood of Los Angeles three decades ago. Now he heads Homeboy Industries, which employs former gang members in a constellation of businesses from screen printing to a farmer's market to a bakery. An op-ed in the Los Angeles Times said of Homeboy Industries, how much bleaker and meaner would L.A. be without it? Father Greg says service is not an end in itself, but a beginning towards finding real kinship with others. That's in this story he tells, for example, about giving a blessing to a kid named Louis. I said, you know, Louis, uh, I'm proud to know you, and uh, my life is richer because you came into it. And when you were born, you know, the world became a better place. And I'm proud to call you my son. Even though, and I don't know why I decided to add this part, (laughs) at times you can really be a huge pain in the ass. (laughs) And he looks up at you and smiles, he says, the feeling's mutual. (laughs) (laughs) And and, you know, suddenly kinship so quickly, you know, it's, you're not sort of this delivery system, but maybe I return him to himself But there is no doubt that he's returned me to myself. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Father Greg Boyle first became known to a wide audience in the 1990s when a book was written about him called G-Dog and the Homeboys. In 2010, he wrote his own very moving memoir, Tattoos on the Heart, and more recently penned a terrific follow-up, Barking to the Choir. In addition to Homeboy Industries, Father Greg's work with young men and women also includes free services like GED classes, life counseling, and tattoo removal. I interviewed Greg Boyle at the Outdoor Hall of Philosophy at the Chautauqua Institution in the summer of 2012. I want us to talk, obviously, about what you do, um, but really focus in on the why of it and, you know, on what these experiences have worked in you and how they've formed your sense of who God is and what it means to be human. But first of all, tell us um, how you came to your call to be a Jesuit. Uh, First of all, it's so great to be here and uh, uh, I'm so honored to be in a conversation with you. I'm a big fan, though I do have a recurring nightmare that I'm interviewed by Krista Tippett and I'm I'm found shallow and lacking faith. Uh, This is way better than the actual nightmare I have. (laughs) Well, I was educated by Jesuits, so I, I, uh, um, for me, they were always sort of this combo burger of uh, absolute hilarity and joy and the most fun people to be around, and they were prophetic. So this was during the time of the Vietnam War, and uh, so we'd laugh a lot, and and I'd go with them to... uh, protesting the war. And so the combination of the prophetic and the hilarious, I love that. So I, I thought, boy, I wanna, I want what the, I'll have what they're having, you know. Uh, so that's what I did. It's not very deep, but that's kind of... Uh, <laughs> uh, the reasons you join a, a, an organization like the Society of Jesus aren't the reasons you stay, but uh, that's kind of was my initial hook. Right. Why did you stay? Tell me that. <laughs> I got a feeling you might ask that. <laughs> 
again, it's, a, it's a, La Compañía de Jesús is a, kind of what St. Ignatius called the thing. So uh, it's about being in companionship with Jesus. And St. Ignatius, ha- in his spiritual exercises, has a, um, a meditation called The Two Standards. And in it, he says very simply, see Jesus standing in the lowly place. It's not about saluting a, a set of beliefs necessary. It's about... Uh, walking with Jesus and being a companion. And uh, I haven't found anything that's brought me more life or joy than uh, standing with Jesus, but also with the particularity of standing in the lowly place with the easily despised and the readily left out and uh, with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop Hmm. and with the disposable so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. And I, uh, I find the fullness of life in, in trying to, as best I can in my own way, to stand there. So that particular place where the Jesuits took you um, in 1986, is that right, is to the Dolores Mission? Um, which at that time, I don't know if this is still true, was the poorest parish in the city and had the highest concentration of gang activity in the world at that time. And there's so much grief and so much heartbreak in these kids' lives and in the stories that you tell. And yet, um, you always come back again and again to talking in this way, you know, that spiritually, theologically, this is not so much about helping others, um, I'm saying that, but that this is fundamentally about our common call to delight in one another. I think that's very unexpected language. Well, the, uh, Dorothy Day, uh, I think she quotes Ruskin when she always talks about the duty to delight. And I think it's right to see it as a duty because it, you have to be absolutely conscious of it. But it's really a delighting that uh, enters into full kinship with each other. I'm greatly privileged in my life to have known Cesar Chavez, who uh, was an extraordinary leader of a movement, but was also one of the best listeners I'd ever known. He could just, you were the only person who existed if you were having a conversation with him. But I remember once a reporter had commented to him and said, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar just shrugged and and smiled, and he said, the feeling's mutual. (laughs) And that's what you hope for. You know, uh, I'm not the great healer, and that gang member over there is in need of my exquisite healing. Uh, The truth is it's mutual. And and that as much as we are called to bridge the distance that exists between us, we have to acknowledge that there's a a distance even in service. You know, a service provider, you're the service recipient, and you want to bridge even that so that you can get to this place of uh, utter mutuality. And I think that's where the place of delight is, you know, that, uh, that I've learned everything of value, really, in the last 25 years from precisely the people who you think are, are on the receiving end of my gifts and talent and wisdom, and, but quite the opposite. It's, uh, it's mutual. And um, I, I always like hearing people tell about the things they did that didn't work out on the way to the things that they know. And it's a very interesting, one of the ways you tried to serve when you first arrived there was you were going to be a peacemaker, right? You were going to make truce between these warring gangs. And you found that, in fact, that, which maybe seemed obvious, wasn't right. Well, you know, a lot of th- anything worth doing is worth uh, failing at, I think. So it seemed sensible to me, and we'd have these Pyrrhic victories of, let's agree not to shoot into each other's houses. I mean, that seems kind of not much of a victory. Uh, and then we'd have ceasefires and truces and peace treaties, and, and it was a lot of shuttle diplomacy where I would do, I'd actually write up a kind of a thing, you know, and they, one side would sign it, the other side would sign it, and it would work for a time, but if you work with gangs, you, you provide oxygen to gangs, and, and that's not a good thing, and I can see that now. One of the realizations you said you made out of that is that peacemaking requires conflict. And while there's lots of violence between gangs, there's not conflict that you can define like you can with a war. Yeah, it's difficult because I'm sort of uh, 
the dissenting voice, I think, in the country at the moment when it comes to this thing. And, and sometimes people will say to you, well, how can you be against peacemaking? Well, obviously, I'm not against peacemaking, but I'm old-fashioned. I think, you know, peacemaking requires conflict, and it's important to say that there is no conflict in gang violence. There's violence, but there's no conflict. So it's not about anything. So you want to understand what language is gang violence speaking. That's important to me. It's about a lethal absence of hope. It's about kids who can't imagine a future for themselves. It's about kids who aren't seeking anything when they join a gang. It's about the fact that they're always fleeing something, always, without exception. So it shifts the way you, you see things. Somebody, Bertrand Russell or somebody said, if you want to change the world, change the metaphor. And that's kind of how we want to, I think we need to proceed in something like this. So if you think it's the Middle East, you're quite mistaken. If you think it's Northern Ireland, wrong again. Uh, it's about kids who've ceased to care. So you want to infuse young people with hope uh, when it seems that hope is foreign. And as you tell their stories, it's hard to imagine where they would draw hope from. I mean, a lot of them, I don't know, I mean, it's not just that many of them have been a abandoned or that they come from a single parent home the stories that stuck with me were the kid whose father left them on the day of his sixth birthday while they were all waiting to light the candles for his dad to come home or the one whose uh, mother literally tortured him because she reminded him so much of his terrible father and there's drug and violence and incarceration in these kids families I mean what also occurs to me, though, because you know them, right? You take delight in them, and you love them. Um, I think that also gives you a much more, well, a sense of how the lines between, you know, what it means to be an enemy or a friend or a victim or a survivor, um, how those things blur in real messy human life. Well, you know, it, lately I've been reading the Acts of the Apostles really carefully, and if you start to read it, and think it's a kind of a quaint snapshot of the earliest Christian community, that's one thing. But what if you were to read it as a measure of the health of any community? So you, you know, see how they love one another, or uh, there is nobody in need in this community, for example. But my favorite one is, it leapt off the page to me, and it says, and awe came upon everyone. So that the measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship. And so that means the, the decided movement towards awe and giant steps away from judgment. So how can we seek really a compassion that can stand in awe at what people have to carry rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it? And, and I think that's sort of the key here. That's the place of health in any community. Forget Christian community. In any community, that's how you know that you're healthy. So recently I gave a, a, a talk, a training, all-day training to 600 social workers, a training on gangs. I had two homies with me, and one of them was a guy named Jose, and, and he got up. He's in his late 20s, and he now works in a substance abuse uh, part of our team, a man in recovery and been a heroin addict and gang member and tattooed and and he gets up and he says, uh, I, very offhandedly, you know, I guess you could say that my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. Um, I, I guess I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, the whole audience did what you just did. They gasped. And then he said, it sounds way worse in Spanish, he said, you know. And, <laughs> and everybody did what you just did, you know. And then he said, you know, I guess I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja, California, and she walked me up to an orphanage, and she said, I found this kid. And then he said, I was there 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me, and she came and rescued me. And then he tells the audience, my mom beat me every single day. In fact, I had to wear three T-shirts to school every day. And then he, he kind of loses the battle with his own tears a little bit, and, and he says, I wore three T-shirts well into my adult years, 
because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. But now my wounds are my friends. I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my wounds. And then he looks at this crowd and he says, how can I help the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon (laughs) everyone. (laughs) Because we're so inclined to kind of judge this kid who, uh, you know, went to prison and is tattooed and is a gang member and homeless and heroin addict and the list goes on. But he was never seeking anything when he ended up in those places. He was always fleeing the story I just told you. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being, today in the Hall of Philosophy at the Chautauqua Institution with Father Greg Boyle, the founder of one of the largest gang intervention programs in the U.S., Homeboy Industries. So, something I think a lot about is how in this culture we've overused and watered down some of the words we need the most that actually mean the most. Compassion is one of them. Love is another. You talked about this a minute ago. I mean, you started talking about compassion, but um, I I like to put some more flesh on those bones of those words. and, And I wonder, you know, if you think about compassion or love, you know, are there... Are there people who come to mind or moments that come to mind that really express what these words have come to mean lived? Well, if you you presume that God is compassionate, loving kindness, uh, that all we're asked to do in the world is to be in the world who God is. And so you're always trying to... uh, But that's huge. Yeah. (laughs) That's huge. Yeah. (laughs) yeah, and, and, and so you're, you're trying to imitate the kind of God you believe in. You, you want to move away from whatever is tiny-spirited and, and judgmental, as I mentioned. But you want to be as spacious as you can be, that you can have room for stuff. And love is all there is, and love is all you are, you know. And, and you want people to recognize the truth of who they are, that they're exactly what God had in mind when God made them. Uh, Alice Miller, who's the late great child psychologist, talked about we're all called to be enlightened witnesses. You know, people who, through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love, return people to themselves. And in the process, you're returned to yourself, you know. Um, Like I have a homie named Louie who's uh, just turned 18, and, and he's kind of a difficult kid. You know, he's exasperating and he's whiny and... And he works for me, although work may be too strong a verb. But, um, but homies that lately have asked me for blessings, and which is odd. It's like in the last three years, and they never. They always ask me on the street or in my office, and they never say, uh, "Father, may I have your blessing?" They always say, "A.G., give me a bless." Yeah. <laughs> And, and they always say it the same way. So, so um, this kid, Louie, I'm talking to him, and, and he's complaining about something. And finally, at the end of it, he says. Um, A.G., give me a bless, yeah. I said, sure. So he comes around to my side of the desk, and he knows the drill, and he bows his head, and I put my hands on his shoulder. And Well, his birthday had been two days before, so it gave me an opportunity to say something to him. And I said, you know, Louis, uh, I'm proud to know you, and uh, my life is richer because you came into it. And when you were born, you know, the world became a better place. And I'm proud to call you my son. Even though, and I don't know why I decided to add this part, (laughs) at times you can really be a huge pain in the ass. (laughs) And he looks up at you and smiles, he says, the feeling's mutual. And, and, you know, suddenly kinship so quickly. You know, it's it's not, uh, you're not sort of this delivery system, you know, but... Yeah, maybe I return him to himself, but there is no doubt that he's returned me to myself. Hmm. Hmm. Um, you use this word spacious, and uh, synonyms for spacious are there all over the place, especially in your memoir, when you're talking about God. 
the spaciousness of God, the vastness of God, the largeness of God. You quote Hafez, this great wild God, God's limitless magnanimity. That's very exciting, you know, really emboldening language. But it's not, I don't think it's a language people would ever reach for themselves if they were shown the statistics about the part of town you minister in, you know, or pictures. And so how do you think about that gap, that disconnect? Well, you know, it, it, I'm a Jesuit, so you know, Ignatius always talks about the God who is always greater. And, and that is part of, you know, the issue whenever you land on a God who's tiny or judgmental or exacting or concerned with some kind of purity code or and it sort of blows it wide open and, and, and knowing that there's a, a need to have this blown wide open all the time. And uh, I, I can remember walking in the projects late at night uh, long ago and there was this kid Mario sitting by himself, 16 years old, just sitting on his little stoop in front of the crummy old projects. So I see him and I greet him and, hey, how you doing? And I sit down next to him and he goes, it's funny that you should show up right now. And I say, why? Well, I was just sitting here praying and I said, God, show me a sign that you're as great as I think you are. And then you showed up. <laughs> well, I, I just think, you know, uh, I remember how moved I was by that, you know, and it's how you enter into the vastness and the spacious place that God holds. But it came by way of um, knowing that the day won't ever come when I am as holy as the people I'm called to serve. That the day won't ever come when I have more courage or am no, or more noble or am closer to God than this 16-year-old gang member sitting alone on his porch. What, what your ministry so bespeaks is um, this incarnational heart of Christianity, you know, but that it always comes down to relationship between people, that that's where we discover God as well. Um, well, it's relational, but it's also, I think we're afraid of the incarnation. And part of it, 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 the fear that drives us is that we have to have our sacred in a certain way. It has to be gold-plated and cost of millions and cast of thousands or something. I don't know. And so we've wrestled the cup out of Jesus' hand and we've replaced it with a chalice because who doesn't know that a chalice is more sacred than a cup? Never mind that Jesus didn't use a chalice. And uh, a story I tell in the book about a, a homie who was on Christmas Day. I said, what you do on Christmas? And he was an orphan and abandoned and abused and by his parents and worked for me in our graffiti crew. And I said, what you do for Christmas? He said, oh, just right here. I said, alone. And he said, no. I invited six other guys from the graffiti crew who didn't had no place to go, he said. And they were all, uh, he named them, and they were enemies with each other. I said, what you do? He goes, you're not going to believe it. I cooked a turkey. <laughs> yeah. I said, well, how'd you prepare the turkey? He says, well, you know, ghetto style. And I said, no, I don't think I'm familiar with that recipe. And he said, well, you rub it with a gang of butter and you squeeze two limones on it and you put salt and pepper, put it in the oven, tasted proper, he said. <laughs> I said, wow, well, what else did you have besides turkey? Well, that's it, just turkey. <laughs> yeah. The seven of us, we just sat in the kitchen staring at the oven, <laughs> waiting for the turkey to be done. Did I mention it tasted proper? I said, yeah, you did. <laughs> So what could be more sacred than seven orphans, enemies, rivals, sitting in a kitchen waiting for a turkey to be done? Jesus doesn't lose any sleep that we will forget that the Eucharist is sacred. He is f anxious that we might forget that it's ordinary, that it's a meal shared among friends. And that's the incarnation, I think. In, in terms of just this idea of incarnation and relationship, I mean, it, it took me a, a long time into my research, reading about you and reading you, to realize that one of the transformative things that happens in homeboy industries 
uh, which is a different model from your peacemaker days, is that people are simply working side by side. Kids who may have been in different gangs, they're sharing days and time and jobs. Is that right? I mean, and, and, and we kind of, my question also is like, does it surprise you at this point in your life that what, you know, one of the, some of the structure your vocation has taken is in starting these businesses? Yeah, you don't want to hear me talk about businesses. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm the least knowledgeable person on how yeah, to start. Yeah, but, you, it's but like, you're don't a try CEO. You're an yeah, executive I'm a CEO. director. Oh okay, my you're gosh, I'm a CEO. Uh, yeah, I, I'm missing a board meeting to be here today, so um, I could not be one bit happier. Uh, yeah, okay, but look, there's Homeboy Bakery, Homeboy Silkscreen, Homeboy Maintenance, Homeboy slash Homegirl Merchandise, Homegirl Cafe. Those are businesses. You yeah. employ people. Yeah, yeah and uh, that came, that was born as we, we began as sort of a job employment referral center, trying to find felony-friendly employers. And, <laughs> and that wasn't so forthcoming, so... So by 92, we had to start our own... We really, so we couldn't wait. The demand was so huge, and and gang members kept saying, if only we had jobs. So, so we started Homeboy Bakery in 1992, and a month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market, a historic kind of area in L.A. Once we had two, once we had plural, you know, we came up with the highfalutin Homeboy Industries, you know, as if there was any industry involved in this venture, you know, so... And then the idea is not just to have a paycheck, but um, I I think one of the new things uh, that I kind of discovered, probably in the last five years, is that community trumps gangs. So it's not enough to just say, here's a job. Our motto uh, still on our t-shirts is nothing stops a bullet like a job. But but that does about 80% of what needs to be done. You know, there's still the other 20%, which is relational, and it's about healing, and it's about what psychologists would call attachment repair. Because gang members come to us with this disorganized attachment. You know, mom was frightening or frightened. And and you can't really soothe yourself if you've never been calmed down by that significant person in your life. And it's never too late to kind of gain this. So they, 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 they repair this attachment. And they learn some resilience. And then they redefine who they are in the world, which is really a huge task. And then we send them on beyond us. And then the world will throw at them what it will, but it won't topple them because they're this renewed person. That, that, that's sort of the new piece in the last five years, that, that there's a task that happens and needs to be addressed and attended to, and that's the task. You know. Were you attending to it? Before, but not as intentionally. I mean, it was happening. That you, right. You've named it now. Yeah, and and but but things like therapy. You know, um, everybody's in therapy, and I have you know three hundred employees, and and I have four paid therapists, but I have forty one volunteer therapists. So, mm-hmm. so but that's kind of a, a new openness to that. That wasn't uh, true in my first ten years. Uh, homies would always say, "Oh, I'm not crazy," and you know the, and yeah. there was a stigma, you know, and then. Uh, I, I noticed it, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 15 years ago, homies would, uh, I'd say, you know, it might help you to talk about all the stuff you've been through in your life. And, and then a homie once said to me, you mean like analyze this? <laughs> and he referenced that, that movie with Billy Crystal and Robert De Niro. And then I started hearing that. And that, you talk about a tipping point where suddenly it was okay for people to be in therapy. And, and mm. uh so I, I don't sense any kind of stigma, which is really healthy and wonderful, because they have a lot of work to do. They've, they've been through a lot. You can listen again and share this conversation with Father Greg Boyle through our website, onbeing.org. I'm Krista Tippett. On Being continues in a moment. Support for On Being with Krista Tippett comes from the Fetzer Institute, helping build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Fetzer envisions a world that embraces love as a guiding principle and animating force for our lives, a powerful love that helps us live in sacred relationship with ourselves, 
others, and the natural world. Learn more by visiting Fetzer.org. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, with Father Greg Boyle at the Hall of Philosophy at the Chautauqua Institution. We've been talking about his understandings of life, of service, and of God, which have emerged through his ministry creating Homeboy Industries. It's one of the largest and most successful gang intervention programs in the U.S. I'm going to ask one more question, and then why don't, why don't we start, open this up for questions and, and comments. Um, you, I've read, were diagnosed with leukemia. Would that have been a decade ago now? Um, I, I think it's probably, I think it's nine years. Nine years. And so you, in a less adrenaline-fueled way than a lot of the people you share life with, have faced mortality. And I wonder, um, has that changed the way you move through life or even this work with them? Yeah, you know, first of all, I wouldn't trade that period of my life for anything. It was about the most graced moment in my life uh, for as uncomfortable as chemotherapy is, and I'm sure many in the audience have been through this, I wouldn't trade it because it was just uh, so intimate and so uh, mutual. And uh, But with the homies, it, it was this uh, extraordinary place of uh, exquisite mutuality that I, I really treasure. I was reading recently about the Dalai Lama. He was interviewed in in The New Yorker, and somebody asked him about his own personal death, and he just shrugged, and he said, change of clothing. (laughs) And that was sort of my experience when I went through leukemia, and uh, greatly liberating. Hmm. And... But because I've had to bury so many kids, 183 kids and kids I loved, and kids I knew, and killed by kids I loved, I mean... Boy, if if death is the worst thing that can happen to you, brace yourself, because you will be toppled. And the trick is not to be toppled. The trick is to to compile a list of all the fates that are worse than uh, death, but also uh, compile the list of all the things, and so numerous to list, all the things that are more powerful than, than death. You know, that's what Jesus did. Jesus sort of put death in its place. Was it after your diagnosis that you discovered this story about the desert fathers and mothers that the one word they meditated on was... Oh. uh, I I just, I read that a couple days ago as I was getting ready for this, and it's been so helpful for me. Yeah, whenever the desert fathers and mothers would get uh, absolutely despondent and and didn't know how they were going to put one foot in front of the next, they had this mantra, and the mantra wasn't God, and the mantra, the word wasn't Jesus, uh, but the word was today, and that that's sort of the key. Uh, there's a play off Broadway right now called Now Hear This. It's now, period, here, H-E-R-E, period, this, period. And that's kind of my, uh, that's become my mantra, I'm big on mantras, so... So when I'm walking or before a kid comes into my office, I always say, now hear this, now hear this, so that I'll be present right here to the person in front of me. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm thinking that, that you've already told me the answer to this question, which is now hear this. But <laughs> I, I hear you. I am moved by your work. I am moved by the plight of the poor, and I am here for a week, and then I go back to my privileged life uh, in Fairfield County, Connecticut, among my Unitarian Universalist co-congregants. What is the message? What is there to be done beside shrugging my shoulders and writing a check? Um, don't stop writing the checks, first of all. <laughs> I, I owe that to my board meeting that's happening right now. Okay, so I buy the indulgence, and then what happens? <laughs> that's yeah. right. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
You know, the, the answer really is kinship. Everybody's so exhausted by kind of the tenor of the polarity right now in our country, and it's uh, and the division is the opposite of God, frankly, you know. Uh, you know, I always think of Dives uh, with Lazarus. Dives is in hell not because he's rich, but because he kind of refused to be in relationship with Lazarus. That that parable is not about bank accounts and heaven. It's really about us. And so, you know, what's on Jesus' mind? He says that all may be one. And that's kind of where we need to inch our way closer, that we imagine a circle of compassion, then we imagine nobody standing outside that circle. You know, God created, if you will, an otherness so that we would uh, dedicate our lives to a union with each other. Thank you. You know, I just want to say that question you posed so beautifully is, is a question that weighs on me. I think so many people are carrying that question around right now. And... Um, feeling pretty hopeless about it. it I mean, it's, a, it's an open question, and, and I Well, also... we're resisting the divide. Hmm? Uh, we're resisting the divide, but we don't know how to do it. Right. We're privileged. Right, we're not even, you know, the idea that you sh- we should create circles of inclusion is... We live so separately that we don't know how to start those relationships, but I... One thing we're, we're not trained to do is... I love Rilke's idea about holding the questions, living the questions until one day you live into an answer. So I, I, I think um, when we don't have the answer immediately before us, we, we then despair. And I, I, I wonder if part of our work now is to hold that question and to pose it with each other. And then in that way, maybe we become listeners together and we start Rilke to... piece is wonderful. Hmm. Thank you. Oh, over here. Sorry. <laughs> I appreciate your personal stories, the interaction you have, but the young man on the steps and the like, but so many in the area where I come from, the way you deal with gangs is you incarcerate them. And so how much of the interaction have you had with the justice system, the penal system, and how can we in communities that want to put these things and depersonalize them away, can we do, can be done societally, congregationally? personally. You know, I don't spend a lot of time in courts anymore, except that I always uh, go as a, I will always testify when asked, and I'm asked a lot uh, in death penalty sentencing cases where there's a gang member and I'm called in as a gang expert because I oppose the death penalty. But, but I've never encountered, and I've probably done 50 of these across the country, I've never encountered somebody, a gang member who's on the stand, uh, a defendant, who, in my estimation, was not mentally ill. The minute you start to hear the profile, and they always give you the profile, you go, wow, this is a deeply disturbed, mentally ill person. No one wants you to say that. The prosecution refuses you to say anything like that. Even the defense says, don't say anything like that. Why? Because then you're forced to, in the face of somebody who's mentally ill, you can only have one response, and that's compassion. And this freaks us out because we go, well, what happens to responsibility? And he knew what he was doing. And prosecutors always say to me, well, he could choose. I go, gosh, you know, not all choices are created equal. And a person's ability to choose is not created equal. I don't know. If we were more sensible, you know, at an early age, we'd be, you know, somehow infusing kids with hope when they can't imagine their future and they're planning their funerals. Or we'd heal kids who are so damaged that they can't see their way clear to transform their pain so they continue to transmit it. Or to deliver mental health services in a timely, effective, appropriate way. If we did those things, if as a society we did those things, we wouldn't be at the place we're at. I'm Krista Tippett, and this is On Being. Today, with Father Greg Boyle on his longtime, unusually successful work with former gang members in Los Angeles. I interviewed him in the Outdoor Hall of Philosophy at the Chautauqua Institution, and we also took questions from the audience. Hello. 
I probably have 50 questions, and it'll be interesting to see which one. 49 of them. In, uh... Which one comes out? <laughs> I, I teach in a community college on the West Coast, and kind of similarly, I teach culinary arts. So I see a whole range of individuals and hear stories that would cripple most of us what people are dealing with. But I think one of my key questions for you is, when I hear you use the word homey, could you define what that means to you? As you give these talks around the country, I think about what are other people taking away from that word versus what it is that that word means to you? Yeah, I, you know, it's sometimes when I go to other parts of the country, I was on a radio show uh, from Chicago where a caller came in. It took quite exception to the word homeboy. Yeah, you don't find that so much in, in Los Angeles. And, and, and no thought went into this at all. You know, that, you know, I'm with a movie producer. I'm trying to get money out of him. And he says, what do you think I should do? And, and he had proposed a lot of ideas. And I said, well, I don't know. Why don't you buy this old abandoned bakery across the street? Uh, we'll call it Homeboy Bakery. That's how much thought went into this. <laughs> so I wasn't, I wasn't kind of measuring and calculating, will this have... But in the end, I'm okay with it because it's sort of like walking in a door and coming out another door. Uh, you'll hear homeboys say, uh, you know, hey, do you know Mr. Uh, Sanchez? You know, he's my uh, math teacher. I said, no, I don't. Oh, that's the homie right there. It's a way of connecting. It's a, it, in, part, in the end, it's a word that does, is soaked with kinship. And, you know, and, it, and if Mother Teresa says the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other, there's the potential anyway, I think, for the word homeboy and homegirl to kind of say eh, we're connected. It's, it's a way of saying we belong to each other. And it doesn't have to do with uh, he's in my gang and he isn't. And, and that's why the homeboy community and home, home girls as well are folks who uh, experience this connection and sense of belonging with each other. I'm particularly impressed with your using the words walking in the lowly places. That's where Jesus would stand. But the question I have is, you also talk about the prophetic and the hilarious. And I recall that if you look at the Dalai Lama, Thomas Merton... Many of them have this wonderful sense of joy. And you seem to have this sense of humor. I often find that peacemakers, peacekeepers, are so intense and the weight is so heavy that there's very little time for laughter. I would like to know how, how it comes that you have this wonderful spirit of joy or, or what I'd call healthy humor. And uh, could you explain a little bit how you got that? Um, it, it's like, I don't know who talked about it, like uh, discussing humor is like dissecting a frog. You can do it, but the frog dies in the process. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, again, it's about joy and uh, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. You want to have a light grasp on life, you know. And then in the end, it's, it's, it's precisely those kinds of moments that teach you something. I mean, real quickly, I, one of my favorite recently was uh, Diane Keaton showed up for lunch at a homegirl cafe, the Oscar-winning actress, Annie Hall, in Godfather movies. And she's there with a regular guy who's there once a week. And, and uh, her waitress is Glinda. And Glinda's a homegirl, been there, done that, tattooed, felon, parolee. Um, she doesn't know who Diane Keaton is, and so she's taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, well, what do you recommend? And Glenda rattles off the three platillos that she really likes, and Diane Keaton says, oh, I'll have that second one. That, that one sounds good. And then it was suddenly at that moment that something dawns on Glenda, and she looks at Diane Keaton, and she goes, wait a minute. I, I feel like I know you, like, like maybe we've met somewhere. And Diane Keaton decides to sort of deflect it humbly and say, oh, gosh, I don't know, I suppose I have one of those faces, you know, that people think they've seen before. And then Glenda goes, no, now I know we were locked up together. <laughs> and... and Aside from the fact that that story absolutely took my breath away when I heard it, and I don't believe we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings, now that I think of it. 
that in the end, it's about something. It's about kinship. It's about Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress, that you may be one. That, that's the whole thing, that God has created this otherness so that you might bump into each other and find that, that you're homies, that you were locked up together. <laughs> you know. I just want to say as we close, um, you said at the beginning, and I, I pushed back and said how hard that is that the job is to be who God is in the world. As you tell these stories of this life you lead, I, you know, you told a story in your book about how when you, and you, you touched on this a minute ago, you first arrived in the neighborhood and you, would, you expected people to come to you and you would walk around and that didn't work. It was when you started visiting people when they were in hospital or visiting people when they were in prison that they then acknowledged you as a member of the community. And that's so resonant with that beautiful passage in Matthew, Matthew 25, about, you know, God saying, you visited me when I was sick, you clothed me, you fed me, and they said, when was that? When you fed, clothed, visited the least of these. So I think it's wonderful how you show that that is doable, incarnating this incarnational message at the heart of Christianity. And you probably are too humble to want to take that in. Oh, well, thank you for that. But I also feel like in the end, you know, uh, it, it is about imitating the kind of, trying to imitate the kind of God you believe in, and, and it's natural for us to push back on that. But the, the truth is, you know, we're so used to a God, a one false move God. And so we're, we're not really accustomed to the no matter whatness of God to the God who's just plain old too busy loving us to be disappointed in us. And that is, I think, the hardest thing to believe, but everybody in this space knows it's the truest thing you can say about God. I wondered if, in closing, you would read this little poem by the 14th century Persian poet Hafez and why you put that in your book. And the fact that it's from the 14th century I love because it reminds us that we've always been this way as human beings. Yeah, I don't know why I put it in my book. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so now I'm living my nightmare of my interview with Krista Tippett. <laughs> now proving myself shallow <laughs> and uninteresting. Anyway, it's called With That Moon Language. Admit something. Everyone you see, you say to them, love me. Of course, you do not do this out loud, otherwise someone would call the cops. Still though, think about this, this great pull in us to connect. Why not become the one who lives with a full moon in each eye that is always saying with that sweet moon language what every other eye in this world is dying to hear? Thank you, Greg Boyle. Father Greg Boyle is founder and executive director of Homeboy Industries in Los Angeles. His books include Tattoos on the Heart, The Power of Boundless Compassion, and more recently, Barking to the Choir, The Power of Radical Kinship. On Being is Trent Gillis, Chris Hegel, Lily Percy, Mariah Helgeson, Maya Tarrell, Marie Sambalay, Bethany Mann, Selena Carlson, Malka Fenevesi, Aaron Farrell, Jill Ganas, Loren Dordal, and Giselle Calderon. This week we say goodbye to two wonderful colleagues, Selena Carlson and Bethany Mann. We wish you all the best and can't wait to see what you do next. Special thanks for this show to Maureen Ravegno, Joan Brown Campbell, and the Chautauqua Institution. And in these days around Thanksgiving, we also have a tradition of thanking all the people who make On Being possible behind the scenes. They include Heather Wong, our transcriber, Brian Carmody, our press liaison, Bethany Iverson for helping gracefully guide the On Being project into its next phase, and Tom Fletcher, Jim Hessian, and Gus Linden, partners in our Loring Park space. 
Emily Oberman and our stellar branding and design partners at Pentagram, Jerry Colonna and the wonderful people at Reboot, Heidi Grindy, Monica Murdo, and Clifton Larson Allen. We're also so grateful for Casper Ter Kyle and Angie Thurston of How We Gather and our incredible On Being Fellows, Jennifer Bailey, Cesar Gonzalez, Anurag Gupta, Lucas Johnson, Ben Catt, Adina Lekovic, Elena Mariscal, Timothy Shriver, Danya Schultz, and Victoria Stoyanova. Also, Micah Thor and the people of Tech Guru, Ben Fry and Fathom for creating our stunning On Being Discovery Engine, Keith Yamashita and Steve Semmelsberger and all the people of SY Partners, our fabulous partners at PRX, including Carrie Hoffman, John Barth, Kathleen Unwin, Sean Nesbitt, Andrew Kuklowitz, and Paloma Orozco. Last but not least, our columnists, Sharon Salzberg, Parker Palmer, Omid Safi, Courtney Martin, Broderick Greer, and others who've graciously contributed to our blog this past year, including Kao Kalia Yang, Ali Schultz, Miguel Clark Mallet, Christina Cleveland, Kate Marvel, Paul Eli, Esther Cohen, and Matthew Septimus. And lastly, to our board members, Julie Zelli, Jay Coles, and Jeffrey Walker, thank you. Our lovely theme music is provided and composed by Zoe Keating. And the last voice you hear singing our final credits in each show is hip-hop artist Lizzo. On Being was created at American Public Media. Our funding partners include the Fetzer Institute, helping to build the spiritual foundation for a loving world. Find them at Fetzer.org. Calliopeia Foundation, working to create a future where universal spiritual values form the foundation of how we care for our common home. The Henry Luce Foundation, in support of public theology reimagined. The Osprey Foundation, a catalyst for empowered, healthy, and fulfilled lives. And the Lilly Endowment, an Indianapolis-based private family foundation dedicated to its founders' interests in religion, community development, and education. On Being is distributed by PRX, the public radio exchange, and is a Krista Tippett public production. Ah.